Beekeeping is a tough, tough business. Beekeepers work very long hours. They're hard workers. They're up before we are. They're, you know, go to bed after we do. They work nights and weekends, and they spend all of their time trying to ensure that the honeybees are healthy enough, frankly, to provide the food that we get. I'm Robin Sessingham, and this is The Zest. Citrus, seafood, Spanish flavor, and southern charm. We're all about food in Florida. An episode so nice, we're playing it twice. This week, we take another listen to one of our superstars from season one of The Zest, Dr. Jamie Ellis from the University of Florida's Honeybee Research and Extension Lab. wanted to make sure that you know about stpetersburgfoodies.com. If you're looking for fun and good food in St. Pete, there are restaurant reviews and podcasts featuring local chefs, restaurateurs, happy hour suggestions, and a lot more. It's all online at stpetersburgfoodies.com. Support for the Zest podcast comes from Seitenbacher brand natural foods like muesli cereals, oils, oatmeal, energy bars, gluten-free fruit gummies for the kids, organic coffee, and more. Available in supermarkets, health food stores, or online at seitenbacher.com. Honeybees aren't just cute, they're crucial, making possible through their pollination an estimated 20 to 30 percent of our food. Florida is one of the top states in the country in honey production with some of the finest quality honey you can find. It's an important wintering ground also for commercial beehives from up north. Snow bees, not snowbirds. Honeybees are in the news a lot, but the news is mixed. It's hard to know how they're doing exactly. To find out, I spoke with Dr. Jamie Ellis, Professor of Entomology and Director of Honey Bee Research at the University of Florida. He also created the University of Florida's Master Beekeeper Program. What's your overall feeling about the state of honeybees, especially in Florida? I read some good news, some bad news, but I would think you have the, you have the broad picture. What, what's your feeling? You know, Rob, that's funny. You ask me that. Everyone who finds out I'm a bee scientist instantly asks me, you know, what's killing the honeybee? So it's, it's a bit of a story, but the issue is, is this. We have about two and a half million honeybee colonies or managed honeybee colonies in the United States. And, and around 2006, beekeepers noticed high loss rates. We were hearing reports from beekeepers somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 percent losses annually. So if you had a 40, you know, 100 colonies, you'd lose 40 of those and only have 60 left. So that phenomenon is what created this issue that early got tagged as colony collapse disorder. And so that's the moniker that everyone knows. People think about honeybees dying. They think about colony collapse disorder. We, we acronym it CCD. And that really hit the world by storm. It didn't just become a Florida issue or a U.S. issue. It became an international issue. So for just over a decade, people have been trying to address what's happening to honeybees. Well, it's tricky. Because if you look closely at the numbers in the United States, we actually have averaged a net increase in the number of honeybee colonies we've had every year for about the past 10 or 12 years. And that net increase is around 1 or so percent. So what we hear from the field is that beekeepers are losing 30 to 40 percent of their colonies. But at the end of the year, what we're seeing statistically is a net increase of about 1 percent. And that's why the message has been confusing to the general public. So let me let me digest it with a story. Essentially what you have, if you have 100 colonies, you're going to experience a gross loss rate of somewhere in the neighborhood of about 40%. So you're going to lose 40 of those colonies and have 60. But the net number suggests that you're actually going to end up with 1% more than you started with at the beginning of the year. So you have to do something to those 60 that you have to regain 41 colonies. And so with those 60 beekeepers can split colonies, they can purchase colonies, etc. But at the end of the day, with a 40% gross loss rate, they'll end up with 1% more colonies than they had. So that's that's the picture that we have going on this in the US, this high gross loss rate, but somehow beekeepers able to increase their numbers on the net side. Now what it sounds like to me is that Used to be beekeepers could maybe buy the hives, 
put the hives out and kind of sit back and let the bees do the work. But since this colony collapse disorder has happened, beekeepers have had to get a lot more proactive, a lot more educated. And they're doing that, obviously. They're, they're doing really well, and they're coming up with this net 1% increase because they're doing a lot more than they used to. Hey, that is a, that is a perfect summary of it. Here, here's the issue, right? So we do have high gross loss rates. If you think about any other agriculture commodity in the U.S., if they were claiming that they were losing 30 to 40 percent of their commodity yearly, you know, the federal government would throw millions upon millions of dollars at it to try to address those issues. But beekeepers have have largely had to address these issues directly. And if you think about it, the fact that they are averaging a net increase, even though the loss rate, the gross loss rate is so high, must mean that this is coming at great sacrifice to beekeepers. And that sacrifice, of course, is, is whereas before, if they didn't have high loss rates, they could make more colonies, more honey, have more available for pollination services. Now, instead, they're having to invest significantly in recovering those losses that they've experienced throughout the year. So I always tell people the heroes in this story happen to be the beekeepers. They're the ones who are shielding the general public from the impacts that these losses could have on the rest of us. Is that why honey is so expensive? Because the beekeepers, especially the commercial beekeepers now, have to put so much more labor and money into propagating the hives? I mean, honey has gotten really expensive. Yeah, that's certainly a contributing factor, right? So uh, another thing that's uh, important in Florida is not just the fact that beekeepers have to work so hard for honey production in Florida, but Florida of all the states in the United States, and I'm bragging just a bit here, Florida actually has among the best honeys across the U.S. Furthermore, when you think about most states, they can only tell you one, maybe two named or significant honeys. Florida has, you know, many honeys that themselves are quite unique. And so not only do do beekeepers have to work so hard to produce honey in this state, but the honey they are producing is really among the best available in the country. So both of those factors contribute to the cost. And it's funny because you're asking me about honey, but honey is only a small part of what honeybees actually do for us. In fact, it's almost insignificant compared to what honeybees do for us through pollination. Let's get to that in a second, because I know that's very important. But I want to get back to how great the honey is in Florida. Florida is one of the top honey producing states in the country. You said also has the best honey. How do you quantify that? What makes it the best? A fantastic question. So if you think about Florida, if you go around the state, people are going to say things. Oh, Jamie, you're a bee scientist. Oh, I just love And the moment they say the word love, they leave this space, and you don't know what's going to come out of their mouth. It's going to be maybe citrus honey, maybe tupelo honey, maybe gallberry honey or palmetto honey, maybe mangrove honey. All of these are amazing honeys that other beekeepers from other states move thousands of colonies to our state just to be able to collect. Tupelo itself is a bush that grows in the swamps in the Florida panhandle, and tupelo is one of the most highly prized honeys on planet Earth. Well, there's and songs so the, written about yeah, Tupelo. Exactly, honey. exactly. So consumers show us that this is the best honey. This is mm-hmm. what they want. What makes it, well, what's the quality? Is it viscousness? Is it the sweetness? Is it just that it's got an unusual floral flavor? Can you, there, can you put your finger on it? Yeah, you know, it's, it's all the above. One of the funny things that most people outside the business don't know is that there, there is this whole culture built around assessing honey quality and honey judging just like you could go to a uh, a wine tasting conference you can go to honey tasting and honey judging conferences and you learn to recognize things that make honey palatable or really good for example uh, sugar content low moisture content but if you think about it too the fact that we say things like citrus honey tupelo honey all of this stuff gallberry etc all of these plants all of these species of plants produce nectar that are un- that's unique to those species. It's, it's almost like those individuals who are producing wine saying that you've got to have grapes grown from this region in France or Italy to produce this wine. Well, honey is even more specialized than that because the same plant in two different states on two different soils with two different humidities can produce slightly different varieties of, of essentially the same type of honey. So there is a world of tastes 
wrapped up into honeys. And it's just a, a really an, an amazing product. So let me ask you about that. So I have friends, a lot of friends who are beekeepers. And I want to ask you about this explosion of interest in beekeeping. But they tell me they don't really have any control over how their honey tastes. A neighbor just brought over um, a jar of honey the other day. I said, this it, it tastes like cotton candy. It is the best honey I have <laughs> ever had. And she said, I have no idea why. I have no control. So I think backyard beekeepers, their their bees go out and forage. They can go up to five miles away. They feel like they don't have any control over how that's going to taste at the end of the day. But commercial beekeepers have to have a standardized product, right? How do they do it? Yeah, so you really are making two points, and I want to address them both just quickly. The first one, the hob- the hobbyist beekeeper maybe who has a couple of colleagues. To me, that's the beauty of the art of honey. If you plant a beehive somewhere, you have no idea the floral bouquet, the richness, the diversity of taste that will be represented in that jar of honey. You know, beekeepers who don't know the floral source basically label the honey wildflower. The word wildflower means we don't know where we don't it know. came from. It just came from out there. But if you think about it, your wildflower would be different from mine here in Gainesville. And to me, that's part of the beauty of the diversity of taste. The same is true across the world. Wherever you plant a beehive, it is going to collect the unique um, arrangement of flower nectar from flowers out in the environment and create a honey that is unique to your area. Now, more specific to your second point, commercial beekeepers, you're right, have to, I guess, in many ways, represent their honey um, um, more honest, honestly. For example, they want to be able to say that this is Tupelo honey or citrus honey. And the best way to accomplish that is they must move their colonies to areas that have high densities of the crop in question. So, for example, if you want to produce Tupelo honey, you've got to take your bees to the swamps of the Florida Panhandle or southeast Georgia, and you've got to put your bees in an area where the dominant floral source in the environment is, in fact, that flower that you're hoping to make that jar of honey um, from. So, for example, Tupelo. In order to make citrus honey, you've got to plant your colonies amongst a bunch of citrus trees. You know, not just two or three. I always get those beekeepers who are just starting and they'll have one citrus tree in their backyard and they can't wait to make citrus honey. But commercial beekeepers know that doesn't work. You've got to plant your colonies among hundreds, maybe thousands of acres of citrus to get those jars of honey. So that's how they do it. Commercial beekeepers are really built on the the, the industry is built on the back of moving bees. You've got to move your bees to those floral sources that you know produce the premium honey. So what has happened in Florida? Because orange blossom honey used to be everywhere and quite abundant, and beekeepers really relied on it. But now since we've had this terrible citrus greening outbreak and we've lost about 70% of our citrus crops, what has happened to orange blossom honey? You've you've essentially you know hit the nail on the head with your question. Essentially, with the with the decline in citrus, beekeepers have had to find other honeys, or more specifically, move bees into the pollination arena. So when, when we think about orange blossom honey, it is declining just because of the availability of citrus is declining. But furthermore, thing you know things that citrus growers are having to do to keep their trees alive, you know are are, are in some ways, my all the herbicides. Uh, yeah, well, herbicides. Some beekeepers point out pesticides, etc. Mm-hmm. One of the things I want to suggest is that's kept some beekeepers from wanting to keep bees on or around citrus. But uh, you know, I, I want to echo the fact that citrus growers, of course, by and large, are following best management practices to to control greening. But certainly, there's this perception among some beekeepers that they just need to stay away from citrus for for, for that purpose. Nevertheless, I, I really want to say that. What has really started to gain attention and traction in the industry is is the migration away from things like that and more towards the pollination of crops. So, okay, so they are taking their beehives to California, to the almond groves, which need, I think, a million hives is, is what I've heard, in order to pollinate the almond trees in California, and that's become a way for beekeepers to make money, right? You know, it's funny. The general public is largely shielded from the, the real business of beekeeping. When they think of honeybees, they think of honey production because honey's in the name. But what honeybees really do for us is pollination, and the growers know this. Many growers produce uh, pollination-dependent de- crops. You name one of those crops, almonds. 
there's also in Florida blueberries, cantaloupes, um, some citrus, squashes, cucumbers, things like that. And what happens is a grower who is who is growing a pollinator dependent crop will pay a beekeeper to move his or her bees to that crop while the crop is in bloom. Now the benefit to the grower is that those honeybees are out there collecting pollen from these flowers and moving pollen from flower to flower. So the grower gets not just more fruit or vegetables, but they get better fruits or vegetables. And the driving crop for the beekeeping industry is exactly the one you note. It's almonds. Every year, over a million and a half of the United States one point or sorry, 2.5 million colonies, every year about a million and a half or higher of the 2.5 million colonies are moved to California just to pollinate the almond crops. That represents on any given year around 60% of the nation's honeybees. And the, and the almond growers will pay somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 to $225 per colony for the bees to just sit out there while the crops in bloom. The average beekeeper who uses his or her bees to pollinate crops will then move their bees from almonds to another three to four different crops before getting their bees ready for winter. So that means these beekeepers are trucking their bees hundreds, maybe thousands of miles around the United States mm-hmm. just to make sure these growers have enough bees to pollinate the crops we need. And, and, and So maybe what from we, almond trees in California to yep. cherry trees in Michigan. Perhaps it's, blueberries in Maine, mm-hmm. some citrus in Florida, watermelons in Georgia, and so on, yes. So this is good for the growers. It's essential for the growers. Um, and the beekeepers are making some money. But I don't know if this is good for the bees. Yeah, so a lot of people point that out, right? So one of the things about honeybees is that honeybees are generalist pollinators. That means that they have to visit multiple uh, species of plants. Just very briefly, honeybees collect nectar, which is a sugar water that plants produce. That they convert to honey. It is a misconception to believe that honey is bee food. It is, in fact, bee fuel. Honey is what moves the bee. Bees have to collect pollen from flowers, and that is more bee food. And so they will collect pollen, bring it back to their hives, and if you leave a honeybee colony alone, it is collecting a diversity of pollen because a diversity of pollen ensures a diversity of protein, vitamins, minerals, nutrients, etc. So some people argue that when you put bees on a crop for four to six weeks, that they're essentially feeding on a monoculture, right? They're getting one crop's pollen and one crop's nectar. And generally speaking, most crops to which honeybees are taken to pollinate are, are poor food sources for honeybees. And so as a result, many beekeepers are having to um, supplement bee colonies nutrition either via, fee- via feeding sugar water or corn syrup to supplement honey losses or pollen patties to supplement um, the loss of pollen or the low quality pollen that's available in the field. So some people point out that, that moving to these monocultures can lead to nutritional issues in bees. What do you think? Is it? Is I think, it... yeah, you know, I think they're certainly a, a contributor to that. When you poll beekeepers around the country and ask them what are the, the three highest, uh, uh, most significant stressors of honeybee colonies, they'll tell you varroa, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a moment. They'll tell you nutrition which is, you know, part of what we've talked about already, and they'll tell you queen quality. So I, I consider nutrition one of the big three when we consider honeybee stressors. And so when they are just in a monoculture, it's just like we wouldn't want to eat potatoes all day, every day. I mean, if they're just having one kind of nectar all the time or for weeks and weeks on end, it might not be good for them. Yeah, you know the story that I tell when I give this talk to beekeepers, I always say it's like putting you out in the field and feeding you McDonald's cheeseburgers every meal for every day and then putting you on a truck and driving you 3,000 miles and throwing you in a new field and feeding you you know, milkshakes every meal every day. While, while these things aren't bad in and of themselves, when it's the thing that's available to you, it can be tricky. So nutritional science is beginning to explode as we all seek to understand how these nutritional impacts ultimately impact colony health and productivity down the road. So you mentioned varroa mites. That is a big cause of the colony loss. Those are little parasites that, how do they hurt the bee? I am I'm, I'm, I'm not going to beat around the bush. Varroa are the 
principal stressor of honeybee colonies on planet Earth. They are the primary killer of honeybees. The data suggests that. Beekeepers suggest that. And just facts and actual managing of bees suggest that. So why is it so bad? Well, Varroa is a really, really small mite. If, if I were to try to cha- train someone from the general public how to recognize it, it would be very difficult. It's just a tiny thing. But relative to the size of the, its host, the bee, it is one of the largest parasites known on the planet. If I were to scale a bee up to our size, the Varroa would be somewhere between a softball and a volleyball size. Ugh. So essentially, it would be like you carrying a volleyball-sized tick on your body oh. that's chewing a hole in your body. And, and Varroa has be, was believed to feed on honeybee hemolymph, which is their blood. It has now been shown with some colleagues and myself that, that Varroa actually feed on honeybee fat bodies. And these fat bodies are responsible for a lot of things in bees, including nutritional management, toxicology, or or pesticide detoxification, and so on. So we've got this huge parasite relative to the size of the bee puncturing the bee and feeding on this, this essential tissue that the bees have. And to make it worse, this parasite transmits pathogens. So the act of feeding is bad enough, but the fact that when this mite bites the bee... It can transmit some of the worst viral uh, pathogens that honeybees have. When you put these together, you get dead bees. And so one of the things that we spend so much time trying to do is educate beekeepers on varroa control. Commercial beekeepers know this with certainty. If they don't control varroa, their bees die. But we also work in our lab to try to identify new varroa control strategies. So without question, varroa are the worst thing that our honeybees have to face. Now, we, you compared it to a tick. I can give my dog and cat flea and tick medicine. Why can't we give the bees in their sugar water or something some kind of anti-varroa medicine? You know, that's actually, to me, the, so far, I mean, you've asked many good questions. This is, this is the, the cream of the crop. What a fantastic question. So let me tell you why it's fantastic. When we have cattle, and we're trying to control flies on a, ca- a uh, cattle, we're trying to control an insect on a mammal. When we have a dog and we've got fleas, we're trying to control an insect on a mammal. When we are trying to control um, the Asian citrus psyllid on the citrus tree, we're trying to control an insect on a plant. But when we're trying to control a mite on a bee, a mite is, is an arthropod, and bees as insects are arthropods. So when essentially we're trying to control a mite on a bee, mm. we're trying to control an arthropod on an arthropod with an arthropodicide. So if you think about it, it's not the same as applying an insecticide to a mammal where we're trying to kill insects on a mammal. We're trying to kill an arthropod on an arthropod with something that's potentially damaging to the one we're trying to protect. And so as a result, there's only a small number of compounds that's, that has toxicities low enough on bees that you can scale high enough to kill mites but not impact bees. It's a tricky, tricky thing to kill. So what is the main thing that beekeepers are doing to get that 1% increase in their total hives? I mean, this sounds like a horrible scourge on the bees. Um, how are they? And, and there's really doesn't sound like there's a good way to fight it right now because you just explained why. What What's the main thing that they're doing? They're pouring efforts into managing nutrition into those colonies. They're pouring efforts to control varroa, and there are a couple of compounds that are available for varroa control. Mm-hmm. They're managing their queens to the best of their ability. They're controlling as many diseases and pests that aren't named varroa as possible. They're moving their bees. They hope to floor resources that they can, um, from which they can benefit. So nutritional management, varroa management, and queen management are, are what beekeepers spend the vast majority of their time doing, trying to make it where those colonies that survive are strong enough to split um, to recover those losses. Beekeeping is a tough, tough business. Beekeepers work very long hours. They're hard workers. They're up before we are. They're you know, go to bed after we do. They work nights and weekends, and they spend all of their time trying to ensure that the honeybees are healthy enough, frankly, to provide the food that we get. You know, there are estimates out there that honeybees are responsible for up to a third of the food that we eat, even if it's less than that, only 20%. That's still one out of every five bites of food that we consume. So beekeepers work hard to to recover their losses so that we can, we can have a stable food supply. So you mentioned 
nutrition, varroa mites, Mm -hmm. queens. What about, we hear a lot about pesticides and that a ban has been lift from certain pesticides and that is killing the bees, which intuitively seems like it would be true because if it's a pesticide kills insects and bees are insects, you're killing bees. Well, you've raised the most controversial issue in our business, the, the impact of pesticides on bees. If you, if you follow the news, if you watch all this, the stories, the read, read about the articles, if you look at all the documentaries, if you watch, read the newspapers, and et cetera, you're going to see pesticides discussed um, for lots of reasons. You know, reason number one, it's just one of the things that people love to hate. Um, reason number two, when you screen honeybee colonies, you actually find pesticide residues in them. You mentioned earlier that honeybees forage five miles up to five miles from their hive. If, if you do the math on that with the area of a circle, you know, being pi r squared, you'll realize that the circle with a radius of five miles is somewhere in the neighborhood of 78 to 80 square miles of area. That means a single honeybee colony planted on the ground can forge an area, you know, up to 80 square miles. And so out in that area, they're being exposed to lots of different things. So so logically, it would make sense, especially when you're moving bees to these crops to pollinate. These crops have to have plant protection products put on them. Logically, it makes sense when you're exposing bees to all these compounds that they would be causing issues. The trouble is, is that science is having very difficult times reproducing the impacts that some are claim some are claiming is happening. There's no doubt that pesticides kill bees every year, but the vast majority of these deaths are due to exposures that never should have happened in the first place. Perhaps the label wasn't followed when the pesticide was applied. Um, Maybe the bees were moved in too late or too early. Uh, Maybe the wrong compound was used or the mixing rate was wrong, etc. So generally speaking, Pesticide labels are developed in a way that when followed appropriately, it minimizes the impact of collateral damage, including damage to pollinators. So a lot of the impacts that people are saying uh, are are happening to bees are hard to reproduce in in, in the lab or in controlled studies. So we've got this idea that pesticides are driving it, but we don't have the data to support that generally. So, of course, you, you might ask me next, then, well, then why did Europe ban the use of certain compounds. And I would say, you know, a good part of, of their reason for doing that was just public pressure. When, when you hear the scientists talk, they, many of them didn't support the ban. Now, of course, there are scientists who, who adamantly believe that pesticides are the driving um, um, impact on bees. But what I would suggest to you is that pesticides are likely one of the top 10 stressors of honeybees. But even when you ask beekeepers, these these three that I mentioned are the ones that just rise to the top year after year after year. And if we could adequately manage those three things, our loss rate, I am utterly convinced, would go so low that um, um, addressing the pesticide issue you know, might not have as much precedent. Now, I will follow all that up with the caveat that some of this becomes a chicken-egg argument. For example, we know that pesticides can cause the death of cells in the honeybee's stomach, the midgut. Well, these cells are important for nutrient handling and maintenance. So when we're seeing something that we recognize as a nutritional deficiency, is it a nutritional deficiency? Or did they get exposed to sublethal doses of pesticides, which led to this nutritional deficiency? And that's where the science is at at the moment, trying to figure out these possible synergisms. So I'm not, by any stretch of the word, you know, trying to rule out pesticides. I'm just saying that, uh, the data suggests, even, even beekeeper surveys suggest, that they're, they're not among the top three or maybe even the top five stressors of honeybees. They're but social, definitely a stressor. But social media and public pressure are not good with nuance, as you, as you mentioned. Yeah, so you pesticide know, is yeah. an easy villain rather mm-hmm. than nutrition. How are you going to be sure. against? Or you know, That's yeah, nothing sure, to be against, sure. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree, yes. So what about there are bees that are native to Florida? Yeah, you know, most people, when they think of bees, they, they think of honeybees, maybe bumblebees. But there's actually 20,000 species of bees on the planet. There's 4,500 species of bees in North America. There's about 320 species of bees in Florida. And of those 320-ish, only one of those is the honeybee. That means we have 319 or so more species of bees 
in Florida. Some of these are introduced, but the vast majority of them are native. Bumblebees, carpenter bees, sweat bees, and leafcutter bees, etc. So there's a huge growing field of pollination ecology where scientists are begin looking, beginning to look at the impacts that these other bees have on crop pollination and they're looking at the importance of these other bees as well. But so, those, yeah, there's a lot of native bees. Uh, okay, but those other bees don't produce honey. That is correct. They're important you know, pollinators like a wasp is or a fly. Well, so I will tell you that th- they're more important pollinators than wasp or flies, and it it's really boils down to one thing. The vast majority of bee species on planet Earth must collect pollen to produce new bees. So bees are built to collect and consume pollen, and as a result of that, they have to get it. And in the process of getting it, they move it around, and in the process of moving it around, we get fruits, vegetables, nuts, and berries. So all bees are important pollinators of something um, in the environment. So that might be uh, native plants that produce berries and fruit, et cetera, for wildlife, but it also includes agriculture. There's plenty of native bees that are important for the production of human food. So I want to ask you about growth in Florida. We're having, you know, a boom, a population boom. And here's something from one of your publications that I found. I'm just going to read this to you. It it says, while many plants are acceptable pollen producers, very few yield enough nectar to produce a surplus honey crop. Those that do generally are indigenous to Florida and may be in danger of being lost to urbanization. So do we have to worry that we're cutting down too many of our indigenous plants and that that could also be maybe contributing to the poor nutrition. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. One of the things that would, would, I think, amaze most people in the general public, if you think about the names on honey jars, there are very few that are actually agricultural crops. Now, we live in Florida, so people are instantly going to throw citrus at me, Mm -hmm. but they won't be able to name another one that's produced from an ag crop. Gallberry, palmetto, tupelo, uh, mangrove, all of these things are native plants. The, the vast majorities of honey produced in the United States are produced from native shrubs or trees, not agricultural crops. So honey production is very dependent on the existence of these wild, unmanaged patches of native plants. I'll give you a great example. In the panhandle, tupelo is so important. Now, we had a hurricane go through the panhandle last year and wipe out large regions of tupelo production so you know it might be a few years before beekeepers are able to make large crops or of tupelo you know if you talk to the beekeepers in the tupelo region they 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 suspect that a lot of tupelo in the past has been affected anyway by fungus so there a lot of these honey sources might be very susceptible especially due to urbanization or disease or pest spread so absolutely important that we manage these um, just for for quality uh, honey production purposes have, has anybody noticed this because of growth? Is that something that anybody has documented or it's just anecdotal? So at, at the moment, it's anecdotal. You'll hear beekeepers talk about it, but, but I do think it's going to be a growing issue moving forward. Speaking of indigenous plants and non-indigenous plants, the Brazilian pepper plant has become really important to beekeepers. So how does that, the tension of that work? Because I know ecologists are trying to get rid of that. Wow, you're asking the million dollar question that can do nothing but get me in trouble. So, <laughs> so let, me, let me just make this statement. You, you, of course, recognize the issue that we have Brazilian pepper in the state of Florida. So Brazilian pepper, for better or for worse, is a major honey plant for beekeepers. It blooms in August and September. It is unquestionably the best nectar source for honeybees in South Florida. It's so good that beekeepers move their colonies to it from other areas of Florida. Why is that good for bees? If if beekeepers keep bees elsewhere, they often have to feed their bees so the bees can store enough honey to survive winter. Well, Brazilian pepper will feed bees for you and give a surplus of honey that bees can beekeepers can harvest and sell it's not a particularly good tasting honey so we call it baker's grade it's the kind of thing that would show up in honey buns or honey nut cheerios stuff like that nevertheless it's extremely important to beekeepers but as you have recognized it is an incredibly invasive destructive terrible for the environment plant 
So as a result, the University of Florida, Florida Department of Ag and Consumer Services, the USDA, et cetera, have ha- has had have had scientists who worked on Brazilian pepper control. Uh, very recently, they uh, released um, an insect that they hope um, stunts or slows the growth of Brazilian pepper. So, you know, I'm kind of sitting between two worlds now where beekeepers are really up in arms that they're about to lose one of their most important honey crops. And, of course, everyone else in the state who would want an invasive species eradicated so that the native species can benefit. So it's definitely a a tricky situation. I mean, the way that we're talking about it now is there's no indication that the releases of insects at the moment are going to eliminate Brazilian pepper overnight. We think it's going to be a very slow decline. I've seen numbers 10 to 15 years before we even start noticing um, a measurable uh, decline in, in biomass, I think is how they talk about it. Nevertheless, the, the sales pitch to beekeepers, though, is that when this stuff disappears or starts to recede, it's going to open up habitat for a lot of our other native plants that can come back and, and serve as floral resources. Now, the real trick is the benefit of Brazilian pepper is not that it produces nectar, it's when it produces nectar. So a lot of beekeepers will hear us say, you know, there will be other things that grow in its place that produce nectar, but many of them consider that of no benefit to them if it doesn't produce nectar in fall. So that's going to be the great trick is is identifying plants that might can take the place of Brazilian pepper that would be good for bees and beekeeping and then figuring out a way to support the planning cultivation of these things. Who pays for that? So it's it's definitely a tricky world uh, we're living in at the moment. I heard about that. A beekeeper just... I just had a hive make its home in my wall, my brick wall of my house. So the beekeeper who came, I hired to come and, and uh, remove it, was was telling me that he said I, we couldn't make it through the winter without the Brazilian pepper. Um, so that's, you know, that's where I heard about it. So what I, what, I, what I would say to that is that what I would say is that management practices now would not permit them maybe to make it through winter. But essentially what would have to happen is there would have to be, um, the bees would have to be fed. And, and you know, for better or for worse, the rest of the country does that. You know, we're kind of unique that we have this amazing fall flow. So, that, you know, there are plenty of other beekeepers around the rest of the country who, who've who had to develop manage, management strat- strategies to, to not have nectar available during that time of year. I have a couple friends just on my street who have been up to your bee college. And <laughs> so from just from my limited experience, this backyard beekeeping is booming. Are you seeing an increase in interest in that? Oh, my goodness. It has absolutely exploded. When I got hired in 2006, there were 1,100 or so registered beekeepers in the state of Florida. There's now nearly 5,000. We have seen an increase from about 100 to 150,000 colonies to nearly 600,000 colonies. So we've had a four to five fold increase in beekeepers and bees in this state during the last 10 or 12 years. So it has absolutely exploded. Commercial beekeepers from other states are coming to Florida to overwinter their hives because almonds bloom so early and they want to get their colonies a head start in a warm state before they move their bees out west. So our state has has just grown in importance, not only for backyard hobbyist beekeepers, but also for the commercial industry. I think somewhere between 20 and 25% of the nation's bees pass through our state any given year. So all of this has just amplified the, the responsibilities we have at the University of Florida. So many more beekeepers, so many more bee colonies, and we, we stay busy all the time as a result. And it's because of the the weather then, because we have warm weather and... Yeah, you know, a lot of it's warm weather. Some of it's Brazilian pepper. You know, beekeepers can come move their bees here and get get that honey flow, strengthening their colonies. But but a lot of it has to do with the warm climate. You know, know, the bees we keep are temperate bees, which means that in winter they're supposed to slow down. They store honey so they can survive winter. So what you do is when you bring them to Florida, you can keep colonies abnormally strong So they're ready to go pollinate in late January, February when the almonds come into bloom. So a lot of beekeepers from the northern states will overwinter bees in southern states. And Florida, for many reasons, has just become um, um, a a state of destination. So we have snowbirds. We also have snow bees. And so it's a place that people like to come with their bees during winter. One more question. How big a problem is fake honey? 
Fake honey has been a big problem in the industry. When when you poll beekeepers about what's their biggest issues, you kind of have to separate it into multiple groups. When you when you talk about bee losses, it's all related to varroa nutrition, these other things we've talked about. But when you talk about just issues from the business perspective, it's often labor, it's often uh, insurance related stuff, and, and many times it's fighting adulterated honey and you know, there's claims that there's lots of honey coming in from outside the U.S. Uh, worse yet, uh, there's there's stuff that's being called honey that's not. Florida, the Florida State Beekeepers Association, worked with the Florida Department of Ag and Consumer Services, as well as my team at the University of Florida, about 10 or 12 years ago to develop the, the state's first definition of honey. The definition essentially says that honey has to be a product produced by honeybees from the nectar from flowers. Well, you know, before that, you could feed bees sugar water, and they would make a honey-like substance, and you could extract that and kind of mix it. And as long as the jar had 51% or more honey, you know, you could slap a label on it that said honey. Well, these days, if it says honey, it has to be honey. So there's claims of adulteration. There's claims of watering down honey. Uh, a lot of commercial guys will complain about honey imports from China and other places that they believe are coming into the country illegally. So this, this is definitely a big issue for beekeepers. Is there any way to know for the person shopping in the grocery store who sees a shelf and, you know, some of it's not local, it's just a a big, you know, uh, honey company. Is there any way to know? Is that real? Let me tell you, it's incredibly difficult to know once you are looking at a jar of honey on the store shelf. What I always suggest to beekeepers, or sorry, to consumers, is we have beekeepers everywhere in the state. If you go to your local farmer's market, you are almost certainly going to run into a local beekeeper selling local honey. There are bee clubs all around the state, 40 or 50 of them. Why do I say that? Because the consumer can go to the Florida State Beekeeper Association's website, find their local bee club, and find local beekeepers in their area. Why I say all of this? Because I strongly promote um, consumers buying and consuming local honey. Does that guarantee that they're getting pure honey no but it certainly tilts the scale in their favor and that's not me trying to belittle the 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 honey on the 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 mega store shelves but it's really uh the best way that they can um increase the odds that they're buying stuff that they know with certainty to be pure honey and what you're going to find is that you're just going to take a lot of pride in being able to consume the honey that's produced in your area jamie ellis thank you so much for being with us today it's been my absolute pleasure thanks for having me Thanks for all your research. You clearly looked up some things. So yeah, good well, I'm questions. enjoying so, it. Like I said, I had them living with me in my house. Yeah, <laughs> you know what's funny is I know you're going to introduce yourself to me at the next bee college because this is how it always starts. People get a little bit interested, and before they know it, they're beekeepers. So yes. I look, to, I look forward to meeting you as a beekeeper because I know it's going to happen. <laughs> all right, thank you. All right, take care. That was Dr. Jamie Ellis of the University of Florida's Honey Bee Research Lab. For more on Florida gardening and agriculture, check out the last two episodes. In episode 25, we talked to writer Heather McPherson about Florida's dairy farmers, among other things. And last week, Delia spoke to Robert Bowden of Orlando's Lou Gardens about how to grow food for ourselves. Thanks so much for listening. I'm Robin Sessingham. Delia Colon and I produce The Zest with help from Cheyenne Jaglau and Mark Hayes. Copyright 2020, WUSF Public Media, University of South Florida.